Purgatory Explained, Chapter 55, Part 2 Means to Avoid Purgatory, Holy Acceptation of Death The sixth means to avoid purgatory is the humble and submissive acceptation of death in expiation for our sins. It is a generous act by which we make a sacrifice of our life to God in union with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ upon the cross. Do you desire an example of this holy resignation of life into the hands of the Creator? On December 2, 1638, there died a at Rishak, on the right bank of the Rhine, Father George Aquitanus of the Society of Jesus. Twice he had devoted his life to the service of the plague-stricken. It happened that on two different occasions, the pest raged with such fury that it was almost impossible to approach the sick without being attacked by the contagion. Everyone fled and abandoned the dying to their unhappy fate. But Father Aquitanus, placing his life in the hands of God, made himself the servant and the apostle of the sick. He employed himself exclusively in relieving their sufferings and in administering to them the sacrament. God preserved him during the first visitation of the pest, but when it again broke out with renewed violence, and the man of God was called upon for the second time to devote himself to the care of the sick. God this time accepted, accepted his sacrifice. When a victim of his charity, he lay extended upon his bed of death. He was asked if he willingly made the sacrifice of his life to God. Oh, he replied, full of joy, if I had a million lives to offer him, he knows how readily I would give them to him. Such an act, it is easy to understand, is, the very, is very meritorious in the sight of God. Does it not resemble that supreme act of charity accomplished by the martyrs who died for Jesus Christ, and which, like baptism, effaces all sin and cancels all debts? Greater love than this, says our Lord, no man hath, that a man lay down his life for his friend. John fifteen thirteen. To make this act in time of sickness, it is useful not to say necessary that the patient should understand his condition and know that his end is approaching. It is therefore to do him great injury to withhold this knowledge from him through a false delicacy. We must, says St. Alphonsus, prudently impart to the sick person the knowledge of his danger. If the patient endeavors to deceive himself with illusions, if instead of resigning himself into the hands of God, he thinks only of his cure, even when he receives all the sacraments, he does himself a deplorable wrong. We read in the life of Venerable Mother Francis of the Blessed Sacrament, a religious of Pampeluna, by jo Joachim of St. Mary, that a soul was condemned to a long purgatory for not having had a true submission to the divine will upon her deathbed. She was otherwise a very pious young person, but when the icy hand of death came to touch her in the flower of her youth, nature recoiled, and she had not the courage to resign herself into the ever-loving hands of her heavenly Father. She would not die yet. She expired, nevertheless, and the venerable Mother Francis, who received frequent visits from the souls of the departed, learned that this soul had to expiate her long sufferings, her want of submission to the decrees of her Creator. 
The Life of Venerable Father Carafa by Father Bartoli furnished us with a more controlling example. Father Vincent Carafa, General of the Society of Jesus, was called to prepare death for death a young nobleman who was condemned to be executed and who thought himself condemned to death to death unjustly. To die in the flower of one's age, when one is rich, happy, and when the future smiles upon us is hard, we must own. Yet a criminal who is a prey to remorse of conscience may resign himself to it and accept it as a chastisement and expiation for his crime. But what shall we say of a person who is innocent? The father had, therefore, a difficult task to accomplish. Nevertheless, assisted by grace, he knew so well how to manage this unhappy man. He spoke with such unction of the faults of his past life and of the necessity of making sanctification to divine justice, satisfaction to divine justice. He made him understand so thoroughly how God permitted this temporal chastisement for his good that he crushed rebellious nature and completely changed the sentiments of his heart. The young man looked upon his sentence as an expiation which would obtain for him the pardon of God, mounted the scaffold not only with resignation but also with a truly Christian joy. Up to the last moment, even under the acts of the executioner, he blessed God and implored his mercy to the great edification of all those who assisted at his execution. At the moment when his head fell off, Father Carafa saw his soul rise triumphantly to heaven. He immediately went to the mother of the young man to console her by relating what he had seen. He was so transported with joy that on returning to his cell, he ceased not to cry aloud, O oh, happy man, O oh, happy man. The family wished to have a great number of masses celebrated for the repose of his soul. It is superfluous, replied the father. We must rather thank God and rejoice, for I declare to you, to you that his soul has not even passed through purgatory. Another day, whilst engaged in some work, he suddenly stopped, his countenance changed, and he looked towards heaven. Then he was heard to cry out, O oh, happy lot, O oh, happy lot. And when this companion asked him for an explanation of these words, Ah, my dear father, he replied, it was the soul of that condemned man which appears appeared to me in glory. Oh, how profitable to him has been his res resignation. Sister Mary of St. Joseph, one of the four first Carmelites who embraced the reform of St. Teresa, was a religious of great virtue. The end of her career approached, and our Lord, wishing that his spouse should be received into heaven in triumph, on breathing her last sigh, purified and adorned her soul by the sufferings which marked the end of her life. During the last four days which she passed upon earth, she lost her speech and the use of her senses. She was a prey to frightful agony, and the religious were heartbroken to see her in that state. Mother Isabella of St. Dominic Prioress of the convent, approached the sick religious and suggested her to her to make many acts of resignation and total abandonment, abandonment of herself into the hands of God. Sister Mary of St. Joseph heard her and made these acts interiorly, <clears throat> but without being able to give any exterior sign thereof. She died in these holy dispositions, and on the very day of her death, whilst Mother Elizabeth, 
Isabella was hearing Mass and praying for the repose of her soul. Our Lord showed her the soul of his faithful spouse, crowned in glory, and said, She is of the number of those who follow the Lamb. Sister Mary of St. Joseph, on her part, thanked Mother Isabella for all the good she had procured for her at the hour of her death. She added that the acts of resignation, which she had suggested to her, had merited for her great glory in paradise and had exempted her from the pains of purgatory. Life of Mother Isabella What happiness to quit this miserable life, to enter the only true and blessed one, we all may enjoy this happiness if we employ the means which Jesus Christ has given us for making satisfaction in this world and for preparing our souls perfectly to appear in his presence. The soul thus prepared is filled with, in her last hour with the sweetest confidence. She has, as it were, a foretaste of heaven, the experiences which St. John of the Cross has written on the death of a saint in his living flame of love. Perfect love of God, he says, renders death agreeable, making the soul taste the greatest sweetness therein. The soul that loves is inundated with the torment, torrent of delights at the approach of that moment when she is about to enjoy the full possession of her beloved. On the point of being delivered from this prison of the body, she seems already to contemplate the glories of paradise, and all within her is transformed into love. Purgatory Explained Protestation of the Author In conformity to the decree of Urban VIII, Sanctissimum, Sanctissimum of March 13, 1525. We declare that if in this work we have cited facts represented to be supernatural, nothing but a personal and private authority is to be attached to our opinion. The discernment of facts of this kind belong to the supreme authority of the Church. Canon 30, Session 6, The Council of Trent, January 13, 1547. If anyone says that after the reception of the grace of justification, the guilt is so remitted and the debt of eternal punishment so blotted out to every repentant sinner that no debt of temporal punishment remains to be discharged, either in this world or in purgatory, before the gates of heaven can be opened, let him be anathema. <clears throat> Decree Concerning Purgatory, the Council of Trent, Session 25, December 4th, 1563. Since the Catholic Church, instructed by the Holy Ghost, has, following the sacred writings and the ancient traditions of the Fathers, taught in sacred councils and very recently in this ecumenical council, that there is a purgatory and that the souls there detained are aided by the suffrages of the faithful and chiefly by the acceptable sacrifice of the altar, the Holy Council commands the bishops that they strive diligently to the end that the sound doctrine of purgatory transmitted by the fathers and sacred councils be believed and maintained by the, the faithful of Christ and be everywhere taught and preached. Canons Concerning the Sacrament of Penance, the Council of Trent, Session 14, November 25, 
1551. Canon 12. If anyone says that God always pardons the whole penalty together with the guilt, and that the satisfaction of penitence is nothing else than the faith by which they perceive that Christ has satisfied for them, let him be anathema. Canon 13. If anyone says that satisfaction for sins, as to their temporal punishment, is in no way made to God through the merits of Christ by the punishments inflicted by him and borne patiently, or by those imposed by the priest, or even those voluntarily undertaken, as by fast, prayers, almsgiving, giving, and other works of piety, and that therefore the best penance is merely a new life, let him be anathema. Canon 14. If anyone says that the satisfactions by which penitents atone for their sins through Christ are not a worship of God but traditions of men, which obscure the doctrine of grace and the true worship of God and the beneficence itself of the death of Christ, let him be anathema. Canon 15. If anyone said that the keys have been given to the church only to loose and not also to bind, and that therefore priests, when imposing penalties on those who confess, act contrary to the purpose of the keys and to the institution of Christ, and that it is a fiction that there remains often a temporal punishment to be discharged after the eternal punishment has by virtue of the keys been removed. Let him be anathema. Chapter 9 On the Works of Satisfaction Session 14 The Council of Trent November 25, 1551 The Council teaches, furthermore, that the liberality of the divine munificence is so great that we are able, through Jesus Christ, to make satisfaction to God the Father, not only by punishments voluntarily undertaken by ourselves to atone for sins, or by those imposed by the judgment of the priest according to the measure of our offenses, but also and this is the greatest proof of love by the temporal in afflictions imposed by God and borne patiently by us. <laughs>